Thanks very much to the organisers for inviting me um, and particularly giving me the opportunity to speak second. Um, I've never spoken second at a conference before. As a modeler, I'm always on the last day. Look at any conference programme, modelers always come the last day. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, it also has thrown me a little bit because I, normally I get the chance to tweak my slides to suit the audience. So I'm always there on the last day of the conference going, oh, well, so-and-so said this, so-and-so said that. I can just change stuff. Um, this time I don't get the chance to do that. So I actually have to like, start from first, first principles. Um, so being a modeler, I felt that it was really necessary to nail down what a trait was before I started talking about traits because this, this, the, the, the traits term is very, very broad. Um, and the standard definition, as Peter says, comes from this paper by Viol, which says that a trait is any morphological, physiological or phenological feature measurable at the individual level. So it's basically anything you can measure on a plant, anything at all. Um, it could be, you know, it could be um, bark colour, that's a trait. Um, it could be height, that's a trait. Um, for me, that's, that's, too, that's too general, and I don't think it actually reflects what people really think about as traits. So I did a bit of a sampling of some of the people that I work with to try and find out what they thought traits actually were. And a lot of people came up with a definition which was something like what, what Mark Chelka suggested, that it's a trait is actually something that characterises a species. So it's not, it's not anything that you can measure, it's something that's really quite specific to that species. Um, but then Mark and I went off on this long tangent about whether relative growth rate was a trait or not. Um, and so relative growth rate, it does characterise a species. There are some species that have fast, some species that have slow, but you can't really measure it in such a way as to show that very easily because it also depends on so many other things. It depends on the plant size incredibly, depends on the temperature, depends on the environment. So um, I don't think we agreed in the end, but I, I, I was moving away from Mark's definition and moving towards a definition that Ian actually gave me a couple of years ago when I tried to pick his brain about what a trait was. And so Ian's definition was just, it's something that's more constant within a species than across species. And I, I found that really quite helpful because we all know that everything you can measure on a plant varies, um, but if it's something that kind of is more, you can, you can look at the variability in a huge data set and the, the, the variation is across the species rather than within the species. So that's kind of gelling with my way of thinking about it. Um, I had to say I got a few more, um, more tongue-in-cheek definitions of traits as well. So Brendan's version was anything that correlates with anything else. Um, and some, someone else nameless said anything you can measure, anything that ecologists can measure. So apparently like leaf mechanical strength became a trait as soon as Mark Westerby got the machine that does leaf, leaf mechanical strength. Um, anyway, so my idea of a trait is something, it's more constant within a species than across species. And really that maps fairly nicely to a model parameter. And so what I've been trying to get my head around for years actually, ever since I moved to Mark Westerby's university, was to think about the relationship between traits and model parameters. So you know models have parameters which are constants, which characterise the species, their input to the model. They also have drivers which are you know, external things, your temperature, your pi, your CO2. And then they have variables, which are things that the model actually simulates and predicts. So things like internal variables, realised photosynthetic rate, or ecosystem uh, GPP. So there is, there is quite a strong relationship between traits and model parameters. Um, it's, not, it's not as simple as that, and part of the reason is because that, that my parameter might be your variable. So different models have different sets of parameters. So some people take, for example, VC max as their parameter, whereas other people take, um, don't, try to predict leaf nitrogen content and try to predict VC max from that. So it's not, it's not as simple as saying this is a trait because this is a parameter, because parameters vary. But I think that's the same thing with traits, actually. So my trait might be your variable. So some people have traits which, which other people would consider as variable. So it's really, it's a little bit context dependent 
and a bit model dependent. Um, the other really nice definition I got was from Roddy, um, actually, where I, <laughs> I don't know if you remember this conversation, Roddy, but, but I said, I think traits are just parameters. And he said, no, 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 traits are things that we can use instead of having to get parameters. Because a lot of model parameters are actually really complicated things that you can't measure. And so this, I mean, just one example, there's hundreds of them in the literature of things that, that, um, that we take as parameters for our model, but you can't actually measure. So the nice thing about traits is that it gives us a way of, of at least getting a handle on what the parameters are. So what, what Brad did here, he's got some parameters uh, like leaf saturated water content, leaf osmotic potential at full turga, not so easy to measure. So what he's done is to measure leaf mass per area and wood density and try and come up with a simple relationship to get the parameters from the traits. Um, I can't remember seeing that part of the literature. <laughs> you definitely said it. I thought it was very <laughs> insightful. <laughs> um, another thing to bear in mind is not, not all model parameters are actually traits. So some model parameters we don't think of as varying by species. So things like um, uh, Rubisco uh, specificity and uh, the Q10 of respiration, we just assume that they're, um, they're, they're constant for all species. So not all parameters are traits. Um, and the other big thing about oh, traits and parameters is that at least in the models that I work with, you have to focus on the dominant species. You can't really think about um, uh, ecosystem average traits. So here's a, a picture of a nice little woodland where we go bike riding some, sometimes near my, near my house. You've got three species in the overstory here and I cannot tell you how many species there are in the understory. There's all sorts of things um, and then you know little tiny things as well. So for me as an ecosystem modeler I really have to worry about what those big plants are doing. I can less worry about these, you know, the, the dozens and dozens of plants in the understory. So my parameters are going to be weighted towards the dominant species. And I think that's a little bit different between the way that most people work with traits, which is often to take an ecosystem average um, across the species. So there's, there's kind of um, uh, thoughts I was working through to try and understand differences between traits and parameters. And so I've, I've kind of ended up with a working definition of what a trait is, which is that it's, it's, it's a measurable something that, uh, that characterises that species that can be used as a model input parameter. All at the same time, we really need to be aware of the sources of variation uh, in, that, in that trait. So with that definition, I can now move on. Um, <laughs> Uh, and just talk about, um, uh, so, um, talk about how we can use traits to get, well, how do we get from traits to ecosystem function? And so my first example is thinking about the carbon side of things. Um, and this comes from a paper that's um, a couple of years old now and just gives an example of how we use traits in our modelling. So this example, what we were trying to do was to look at the CO2 response um, of grassland species um, driven by Peter's Biocon experiment. Um, and so what we had was a very simple model um, where we had our inputs, um, which are basically climate um, and the nitrogen availability in the soil. Um, and then we were simulating photosynthesis, um, NPP, that becomes root biomass, leaf biomass, nitrogen uptake photosynthesis, leaf area index, and nitrogen concentration. Um, and we're representing the different species in this model by their parameters, which we also called traits. And so the sorts of traits that we had were things like our photosynthesis traits, which are VC max per unit nitrogen, um, G1, which I'm going to talk about uh, in a lot more detail shortly, and um, uh, the respiration loss. So this is actually a carbon use efficiency parameter. So how much of your gross photosynthesis is lost to respiration. Allocation parameters. So allocation uh, between foliage uh, and roots and turnover parameters. So lifetime of foliage um, and roots. Um, nitrogen uptake traits, SLA, um, and then the ratio. So another trait we had to have was the ratio of nitrogen content in the roots to that in the, in the foliage. 
Um, we had a bunch of constants in this model as well. So our constants were things like the quantum yield and the temperature dependences, um, the phenology we didn't get to grips with, that was just constant by species. Um, and then we really just focused on um, gra yeah, grasses and forbs, not legumes, not C4s, nothing big, nothing water stressed. So that's kind of our, our you know, uh, our limitation of our universe. Um, in this universe, the model actually comes to a nice equilibrium, which makes it very simple to think about, or relatively simple, if you're a modeler, simple to think about how those traits influence the ecosystem function. Um, and the way that we represent this um, is, to, is to think about the relationship between net primary productivity of that species in monoculture um, as a function of the leaf area index. And there are two relationships, right? So there's one relationship that says you've got an LAI that determines how much MPP you can have. And that's just, uh, with that LAI, you absorb some light, um, which depends on your light extinction coefficient. You use that light to do photosynthesis, which depends on your photosynthesis traits. Um, and you then turn that into productivity, which depends on your carbon use efficiency. And that's kind of a saturating relationship because, because of the fact that as you get more and more light, you can't, as you get more and more leaves, you can't absorb more and more light. Um, the other half of the system um, is to say, okay, given your MPP, that means that you have a certain amount of LAI that you can have. So as this thing comes into equilibrium, the amount of MPP, if you multiply that by the allocation to foliage, the specific leaf area, and the lifespan of the leaves, so the turnover of the foliage, you work out how much LAI you have. And eventually the system comes into an equilibrium where those two lines cross. Um, and so this, this, um, uh, this visualization helps us to understand how our traits influence our productivity because we can easily see how if we change one of those traits, we change where the system sits. Um, so for example, if I change my SLA, all it does is to change this relationship between the LAI and the MPP. So if my SLA becomes lower, um, I can make less leaf area for the same MPP, and hence I get a different relationship here and a lower LAI. Um, if you then think about what happens with elevated CO2, so this exercise was all thinking about elevated CO2 responses. So here, what happens when you increase the CO2 concentration is that you increase the light use efficiency of the foliage. Um, so that's my green line. Um, uh, and then there's a feedback because that increases um, the LAI that can be supported. Um, so here we are at ambient CO2, low SLA, high SLA. Here we are at elevated CO2, low SLA, high SLA. And the, the, um, the implication of this model is that the CO2 response is going to be higher for the thing that had um, the lowest LAI to begin with. So you can see that this, this response from here to here, relatively speaking, is quite a lot larger than this response from here to here. And so what we're seeing is that this model with those assumptions predicts that the responsiveness to CO2 is higher in low productivity systems. So low SLA, low uh, foliage allocation um, uh, species with those traits. Um, so implications of this is really that the slow plants are predicted to be more responsive to elevated CO2. Um, and uh, if you go further than that, it means that elevated CO2 should actually promote coexistence. So you should get um, more of the slow plants in our ecosystems. Um, that is, you know, that's what the model tells us. Um, People don't like this result. I can see Rich making faces already. <laughs> and I know, I know, right, it doesn't gel. And the reason it doesn't gel is because of the, the you know, the assumptions in there um, uh, are that the traits stay the same. 
And so unless, the unless is that perhaps the traits are going to change differentially among species with elevated CO2. Now some of those traits we know really well and we know how much they change with elevated CO2. So SLA changes a tiny bit. VC max per unit nitrogen changes hardly at all. G1 I know very well does not change with elevated CO2. Um, but there's a bunch of other traits in there which are much less well characterised like foliage allocation and like the carbon use efficiency. And then there's a couple of traits which aren't in there at all. And so one of the things that we're spending a lot of time thinking about at the moment is the trade-off between growth and storage. And so plants, this, this model really takes all that photosynthesis and sticks it straight into growth. There's no, there's no, um, uh, what's the word? Um, there's no possibility that the plants might actually be storing carbon for later on. So one thing that we're doing with our models now is to try and add in um, a storage strategy. So I would, I would call this a hidden trait. It's not in the models. And yet, you know, when you talk to people about the implications of photosynthesis for growth, they kind of, most physiologists, have a feeling that that trait should be somewhere in there. Um, okay, so how am I doing? All right. Moving right along, that was carbon. I need to talk about water. I assume everyone was going to expect me to talk about water. Um, so um, thinking about water, the main thing that, we're, main thing that characterises the water use of the plant is the stomatal conductance. But the stomatal conductance, I would argue with you, is clearly not a trait. It's really not. It's highly, highly variable. And so this plot comes from our 2011 paper where we were looking at stomatal conductance and how it correlates with photosynthesis, CO2 and VPD. And you can see, I mean, the stomatal conductance, it varies. It varies over the course of the day. It varies with all kinds of environmental conditions. But um, it's predictable. Um, it's predictable from this relationship. And the slope of this relationship varies consistently across species. So the species trait is really the slope of that relationship which is basically our G1. Um, so this, this, the stomatal conductance, we would argue the trait that we need to know about is G1, which is, I know it's not a very catchy name, and, and I often get pulled aside by people to say, but what is G1 really? Um, so G1 is a, is a parameter in a model uh, which we derived um, from the theory of optimal stomatal behaviour. Um, I should say, so Colin has a similar but slightly different model which comes from a different optimization criterion which arrives at basically the same uh, model. Um, and Roddy has another one now which he's got a poster about which you have to go and look at um, uh, if you're interested in G1, that is. Um, it's, but basically, yes, okay, so the same model can be obtained from different optimization criteria. Um, the way I think of this G1 parameter, it's related to the marginal cost of water to the plant. So it's kind of related to the plant's carbon to water trade-off strategy. But we really haven't come up with a good name for it. Sometimes I call it the stomatal slope parameter. Sometimes I call it the stomatal operating point. Mostly I just say G1 and hope that everyone knows what I mean. Um, so G1 we know does vary systematically um, across PFTs. And so this is from a paper uh, in 2015 led by Yan-Chi Lin, where she collated a whole bunch of stomatal conductance data um, and put it together um, and found systematic differences with lower G1s in gymnosperms than in angiosperms, shrubs, grasses, and crops. Um, these data are all online, by the way, Figshare, if you want to play with stomatal conductance data. Um, it's also would appear, at least in this data set, to be related to wood density, which is a nice thing. It's, it's, it's clearly a trait because it's correlated with something else. Um, uh, <coughs> um, one, of the, one of the problems that we have at the moment is that scaling it up to the ecosystem, it doesn't work as we thought it was going to. So Yan Shi, found these really nice differences across species and we expected across PFTs sorry and we expected that they would translate to differences in a similar parameter G1 at canopy scale 
And so what, what we did was to derive these G1s using three different sources of data, the leaf gas exchange data, leaf isotope data, um, which it, we've got a very large database put together by Will Cornwell, um, and the Fluxnet data. And we had thought that we would see the same patterns across ecosystems, but we don't. And this really troubles me because it, it says that there's something that we don't know yet. So if you look at this figure, the green ones are our leaf gas exchange data. And there's clear differences between the needle leaves, the broad leaves. Um, those patterns are kind of there in the isotope data as well. So again, you can see the difference between the needle leaves and the broad leaves. I don't know what's going on with the tropical forest and the isotope data. Um, that's, you know, there's, there's a bunch of questions in this paper, it has to be said. But if you look at the Fluxnet data, there's absolutely no difference in this G1 parameter across, eco across PFTs. Um, and so uh, Zonka has a PhD student who's been looking into this in some detail, but we still haven't really figured out what's going on. So perhaps it's a problem with the way that we scale from the leaves to the ecosystems could also be a problem with the, the fact that the, um, the eddy covariance energy balance doesn't always close. So perhaps the, um, the transpiration fluxes aren't as reliable as we might help. So this paper is one of those papers that was kind of difficult to publish because it doesn't have an answer. It has lots of questions in it. Um, you know, we need to figure this out to be able to use this G1 parameter. Um, okay, let me see. Um, I have so many things I could possibly talk about and they're all in here and I've just got to decide which ones to put in. Okay, um, we'll see how far we get. Um, very briefly, G0 wasn't in the model um, originally. We had to put a G0 in there to make the model stable um, uh, and people do often pull me aside and say, what are we doing about G0? Um, and so what we're thinking at the moment is that the problem with the G0, what it is, is, the, is what you get for conductance when photosynthesis has gone to zero. And photosynthesis goes to zero for lots of different reasons. So sometimes it goes to zero because it's night. And then you have stomatal conductance. But that's really different from what goes on during the day. So we want to have nighttime separate. Uh, it goes to zero at low par during the day. Um, uh, so we need to have something that happens at low par and Roddy's optimization model actually I think might have a way of dealing with this which I'm, I'm hopeful will work. Um, it also goes to zero at really high temperatures. So as soon as photosynthesis, it, you know, as soon as it's above 40 degrees, photosynthesis goes to zero. Um, John Drake has a really nice paper that's in review at the moment that shows that at really high temperatures, canopy carbon uptake goes to zero um, but, for, but the transpiration really doesn't. And so, of course, it's because the, the leaves want to cool uh, if they possibly can. So the stomata remain open uh, during heat waves if they possibly can. And that's a really different process from what happens at low par. And so we're trying to differentiate between these things. Um, there's also um, what happens when you have really low soil moisture. So photosynthesis can go to zero at low soil moisture. Um, the plant is then trying to shut its stomata as much as it can, but you still have a cuticular conductance or a leakiness, which determines the plant desiccation rate, which is actually really important um, in uh, simulations of plant mortality. So we're also working on trying to figure out how to simulate that G0 at low soil moisture. Um, but they're really different, simulation, different, different situations and you can't um, use, you can't substitute one for the other. Um, Okay, so I'm going to skip this bit, sorry. Uh, um, the other thing that we know about G1 is that it does vary with soil moisture. Um, and it varies systematically, again. So it varies systematically across species. Um, so this figure comes from uh, a paper by a PhD student of Collins, um, Shuangzi Zhou, uh, who looked at this G1 parameter, how it responded to pre-dawn leaf water potential um, across species from different environments. And really what he found is that species from, from wet environments had a much steeper um, response than did species from dry environments. Um, we're now finding this um, across wider sets of species. 
Um, and it's also nice because it correlates uh, with other features of the plant. So these data come from an experiment that's just been run by another PhD student, Xi Meng Li, uh, and Chris Blackman, who's a postdoc with us, where he was looking um, across that gradient in rainfall that Peter was showing. Um, it's a gradient in rainfall that crosses New South Wales and goes from um, over 1,000 millimetres down to 200 millimetres. Um, what we find across that gradient um, is that um, the xylem, uh, xylem vulnerability, so this, this, what I'm showing here is P50. It's the point at which there's a 50% loss of conductivity in the xylem. And it's, it's the trait that Tim Brodrib now calls the super trait uh, in, his, in his most recent commentary in New Fight. Um, uh, because it's so well predictable from, uh, from environment, um, it really characterises uh, the plant's vulnerability um, and is very strongly correlated um, with the climatic envelope that the species come from. So R squared of 0.72, Ian would be very happy with that. Um, what we find is that the rate at which the stomata shut with, res with, uh, uh, with respect to um, leaf water potential is also very strongly correlated with that trait. And so what I'm showing here um, are the water potential for 90% stomatal closure. So stomata are pretty much shut versus the water potential for 50% loss of hydraulic conductivity. And there's a really good relationship um, across species from different environments. Um, uh, this relationship can be predicted from, not from optimization theory. So another PhD student, Yao Ji Lu, uh, attempted to implement the optimal stomatal conductance theory uh, to predict how plants should optimally respond um, to drying in a stochastic environment. Um, and found that it really didn't work very well, so moved on to thinking about competition for water. And once you come up with a, um, a model which assumes that plants are competing for water, but that there is a carbon cost of embolism to the plant, then um, you end up with this really nice prediction that the stomatal closure should be really quite strongly related to the P50. And so here what Lou has done is to make different predictions for different carbon costs um, and compare that with a relationship coming from a meta-analysis of these data paper. And it's, it's you know, as you can see, it's, um, it's pretty well spot on. Um, so, um, so to summarise, where are we at with modelling water use? We feel like we've come really quite a long way uh, in recent years. We know a lot about G1. And, how, and this trait really characterises the stomatal conductance. We know a lot about how it varies across species, even though we're a bit worried about how it scales to the ecosystem. Um, we know a lot about stomatal closure in response to soil moisture. Um, we know a lot about um, this P50, this loss of hydraulic conductivity, um, thanks in part to the work of my colleague Brendan Choate and others. Um, there's lots and lots of data coming in um, looking at P50. But of course there are things that we don't know. And so one of the things that I am really struggling with at the moment is that to put all of this into a model you have to, like to get it to work in a model you have to tie up all the loose ends. And one of the loose ends is really about what the roots are doing. And so the rooting depth is the thing that determines the soil water potential that the plant sees. And if we're going to predict stomatal behaviour as a function of uh, the water potential in the plant, we need to understand how the water potential in the plant re uh, relates to the soil water potential. And what you see in almost every ecosystem is that uh, you get plants growing side by side, um, same soil, same uh, environmental, same soil moisture apparently, but very different um, water potential. And so this is just an example from Queensland um, comparing bloodwoods with iron barks um, minus one to minus five pre-dawn water potential, even though they're growing side by side. And I've got lots of other examples um, that are like this. So, um, rooting depth, and rooting depth is one of those traits that, uh, that I'd love to have, but I, I, I know it's going to be a long time before we really 
uh, get a bigger get a bigger data set there. And so uh, this has been a whirlwind tour of some of the traits affecting carbon and water cycling. I feel like there's been really incredible progress over the last few years in understanding plant ecosystem function via traits and clearly you know there's a lot more to come. Um, but I guess a yeah, couple of notes of caution. We do need to be quite careful I think um, what we mean by traits and not just say traits you know sometimes you see papers that say traits explains it and saying traits explains something is, is, is um, you know, is not an explanation at all. You need to mean, you need to say what you mean by traits and be clear about what sources of variation are in your universe and what, si what sources are out. And the other thing is, is uh, that we also need to be aware at least of the, the hidden traits, the storage allocation, the routing depth um, that, can, that can confound our expectations. And that's, that's it for me.